I'm Jane Golly. I'm the director here at the Australian Centre on China in the World, and I have two, um, I think, very important tasks. The first that I'd like to begin with uh, is to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and to pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. And I think at this point in our um, history and our environmental situation that we find ourselves in, I'd really particularly like to recognise and respect their relationship with the land. I think there's so much that we could and should be learning from them, and we're pretty slow learners on that front. They have tens of thousands of years of history, uh, and if only we could learn, uh, we might not be finding ourselves in the situation that we do today. Thank you also for coming out uh, during this rather difficult time. I think a lot of people recovering from the rocky start to the year here, but particularly with the coronavirus. Uh, I understand now that we're not supposed to shake the hands uh, of people that we come into contact with, but some of us are well versed and enjoy a good bow, and I think there are other possibilities there as well. Uh, I've got a double Benjamin Act, and I uh, will now uh, have the uh, pleasure of inviting uh, Dr. Ben Penny to the stage. I'm sure that everyone in the room knows him well. He's a founding fellow and former director of CIW and among many other things that he achieved, I would say he is almost single-handedly with a little bit of help uh, from the architect responsible for managing the project which brought to us the wonderful building that we're sitting in tonight and that we're both fortunate enough to call uh, our academic home. So over to you, Ben. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely building, please enjoy it. Um, it's a great pleasure tonight to welcome you to this George E. Morrison Lecture on Chinese Ethnology. Um, I know that some in the room are regular attendees, some are probably new to this lecture. Um, it is one of the, it is the university's longest standing public lecture. Um, it actually began before the ANU was established. The first Morrison Lecture was given in 1932. It was established um, by a group of largely Chinese people in Australia uh, to remember the great George Ernest Morrison, the, the Australian um, Times correspondent in Peking, amongst many other things. But um, Morrison was a great Australian and one of the uh, first Australians who had a really intimate and profound connection with China. Um, in, after he died, as I say, members of the Chinese community got together and formed the committee that gave birth to this lecture. Uh, it began in 1932, as I say. It paused during the, the Second World War. And then when the ANU was established in 1946, one of the things that the first vice, vice chancellor did was to re-establish the Morrison Lecture as a public lecture hosted by the ANU. And the ANU has held a Morrison Lecture every year since. The list of speakers that have delivered the Morrison Lecture reads like a who's who of the study of China um, uh, over, the, over the period. Some of the great, great names of Chinese studies have been Morrison lecturers. So um, I'm very happy to say tonight that uh, our 81st Morrison lecturer um, only adds luster to that remarkable list of people who have delivered the lecture in the past. We are honored, privileged to have Professor Benjamin Elman here to deliver this lecture. Professor Elman is the, 19, the Gordon Wu 1958 Professor of Chinese Studies at Princeton, now emeritus. Um, he is the author of uh, a large number of books and articles and edited volumes on Chinese history. He is undoubtedly one of the foremost historians of China of our generation. Um, amongst other books, his more recent work, uh, if, I, if I went through the lot, we'd be here for a very long time. His more recent work includes Classicism, Examinations and Cultural History from 2010, A Cultural History of Modern Science in China from 2009, and a textbook in world history from a couple of years ago, Worlds Together, Worlds Apart, A History of the World from the Beginnings of Humankind to the Present, which is 
moderately ambitious as a task. Um, uh, apart from his work at Princeton, uh, Ben has also been um, very involved with directly participating in education and scholarship in East Asia uh, through regular appointments, let me say, at, at the University of Tokyo and at Fudan University in Shanghai. Um, there are two things I've mentioned tonight uh, in this introduction. One is Fudan in Shanghai. One is a book on the history of science. Tonight's lecture brings those two together, as you can see. Um, this is going to be a fascinating and valuable lecture. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Ben over the last few days, and I know that you will uh, enjoy and learn a great deal from this lecture. So, Ben, the stage is yours. Ben, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, I can't possibly live up to it. So I hope you'll forget it as soon as possible. And we'll move on to more humanly uh, domains where I can help out in some areas. It's great to see all of you here. I feared that there would be nobody here because of the, case, the recent problems with uh, the uh, uh, drugs that are passing around and the situation there. But you've all come, you're all brave souls. And I appreciate it a great deal that uh, I'm not speak speaking to a few parasites and uh, the walls uh, on the side. So thank you for coming. I understand the context for all of this. It was great to see Tony Reed here, a former colleague at UCLA and later another opponent when he was at Singapore. And he's done so well at our, our work together at UCLA really brought both of us together in terms of Southeast Asia and East Asian studies, which was very important for all of us. We appreciate that a great deal. Uh, I'm at the end of my career, so I'm quite capable of being irreverent about things that I used to be very reverent about. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, trying to deal with things as they were, when in fact you don't know what they were. Uh, one of the problems with historians is they know the results, and they think that the results tell you what, the, what happened to begin with, when in fact it doesn't work out that way at all. Uh, the learning of what caused something often makes it impossible for you to understand why they made the choices that they did. The people on the ground, the people in the villages, the people in, on, in the government, and other places. So when something started out and uh, people chose, made choices, that's more important in many ways than getting to well, what happened at the end there and what, what, what's so important about the end story. So I'm not the betraying the end story, but I think a beginning story in many cases is very, very useful and helps us understand a great deal of what's going on. Normally, we don't think of Shanghai and science. We think of Shanghai and money. Uh, we think of Shanghai and trade and commerce. We think of it as a kind of a, a anti-Chinese place within the Chinese empire that ruled in th terms of domains, areas outside of the domains of the Qing Manchu dynasty, that it was a city on its own and a very prominent city on its own. Uh, that's certainly true in many ways of what happened uh, with the, goal, with this, the role, role of Shanghai. But I think what intersected more importantly with uh, the rest of the world was that in Shanghai, scientists gathered to try to produce uh, engineers and uh, thinkers and uh, the like to improve the military of Shanghai, the autocracy of Shanghai, and also to gain English interests in the uh, area called Shanghai for future trade and commerce. Uh, they controlled, for example, the, comp the, the major uh, trading centers and also the control of the uh, custom laws uh, at the time. I'll be giving you a good many optical illusions. What you can see in this particular illusion is that the, uh, uh, the, 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 the emperor, if he's an emperor, is uh, being consoled by the British officer. And uh, it's in many ways, it's indicating that it's a whole it's a question of digestion. Uh, you have to have the uh, uh, opium for your uh, own problems. We need the opium money to buy uh, various kinds of commodities uh, to make us able to dissolve the tea we drink, uh, which is a problem for Brits over drinking tea, I assume, and dealing with this issue. There's a similar problem that emerges in this trading network uh, that had to do with the issues of uh, Rhubarb. Rhubarb was a hot commodity in the 19th century. Uh, and anybody that could buy rhubarb could presumably go to the bathroom with ease and confidence. And so this is a focus on uh, digestion uh, and the uses of digestion in these trading mechanisms. People are being killed in the rear. And uh, the Chinese fellow, or perhaps Manchu fellow, is saying, we're doing this for the good of, of our country. And uh, in many ways, we want to uh, have the, uh, uh, the, the, the benefits 
of uh, having the uh, medicines and other things that are available to us in these uh, networks. So in this uh, optical illusion, uh, China and Britain are presented as enemies of sorts, but trying to figure out how to digest their food. And the digestion of food matters in terms of the trade with India for opium and the various op uh, objects and our, our agricultural uh, materials in China themselves that the British Empire is, is limited to, that wants a large uh, collection of porcelain, uh, tea, uh, all kinds of uh, commodities are coming from China, going to uh, Europe via India, and then being returned in the trade. Where's the money? The good deal of the money is in China. And so if we're talking about capitalism, this isn't capitalism quite yet. This is a trading network where the British are forcing upon the Chinese the uh, uh, obedience to uh, buy the opium for uh, the trading mechanisms for those who are uh, addicted to it in the Chinese sector, and this will help the, Indi the British uh, suck up and uh, devour their tea. So tea versus uh, 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 the opium is the key story. And we rarely get that story. We get stories of commodities going back and forth when you suits you. But the British wanted to talk about commodities that later would become commodities based on uh, uh, drugs drugs that were illegal even in the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty. And this kind of uh, illusion here is indicating that the illusions of digestive tract ideas is something that we all need to be very careful about. The British brought uh, portions of Singapore, uh, portions of Shanghai under control very quickly. And this is a uh, outline of what was happening in uh, say, uh, 1842, that the Opium War was ended by 1842, and Shanghai became a treaty port almost immediately. This is what the British wanted. Uh, they had the layout of the river uh, approaching the various other li rivers and providing a, ma a maximum amount of trade and commerce in a single area. Hong Kong was very useful uh, for that purpose, but Shanghai was closer to the big money, the big money in, in Shanghai, uh, Suzhou, Yangzhou, and the other major cultural centers of the Yangtze Delta. The Yangtze Delta was at first uh, looked upon as a, a great trading port. It was that too, but it was also a great area for agricultural goods for porcelain making, and also for building a huge economic uh, framework. So in this context, the British are trying to keep track of things that allow them to uh, serve uh, in gaining access to this huge marketplace. So in, in this particular digest here, we're getting access to what the British wanted from the uh, area, and they noted that this would be a foreign settlement at Shanghai. This would be Shanghai. In brief, the history of Shanghai is being written very quickly in 1842 and being included under the empire of the British in this context. So the British have picked a, a very important place to uh, gain control of. Uh, and its uses of Shanghai for the next 15 years will be building a relationship between the Manchu throne, its uh, Chinese mandarins, and also the uh, people they come into contact with through the British uh, exchange. So the British are, in many ways, incorporating India first and later China into their world system of sorts. So I'm trying to explain to you here that China, like India, is becoming part of a lar much larger and greater economic gain than before and that both India and China will have to come to grips with this very impetuous but well-thought-out way of bringing the uh, Asian states within the framework of trade and commerce of India and China together. We know that the money was in China and India. Uh, they were getting the money for the goods, and the, Indi the British wanted to change the direction of trade so that the opium was coming from Britain, uh, coming from uh, India to uh, China and Chinese the silver was going out via uh, India to Europe. And so in this context, uh, the money travel was as important as the medicines that were traveling. So the, the rhubarb went with silver and also with opium in this trading network. The Bund, which became very famous, was the Bund for the uh, foreign uh, city. Uh, the city of Shanghai was on the uh, northern edge of the, the, the river, the major river going north and south. And the Bund was being built around it uh, in modern Western buildings, usually two stories uh, in their context. You see some of this repeated in Southeast Asia, particularly among uh, Chinese communities living in trading networks that fed into this larger framework of trade between India and China, and that these two-story, three-story brick uh, buildings became uh, places where traders and com communicators could uh, deal with the various issues that they needed to deal with, and they did so accordingly. This is the Bund around uh, 1900. 
And you can begin to see that the shipping is uh, less impressive than it is initially here, uh, but that the um, increase in technology through uh, the engines and uh, ships that were being built in this period of time, the Bund was becoming to be a very major center. The problem with the Bund is that this is only one part of Shanghai. Shanghai was more than just the Bund, more than just the, 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 the harbor on the northern side of the, of the uh, area. The mouse is here which shows you that there are two Shanghais that we have to deal with. This is the foreign concession here that we've just seen called the Bund, and this is the older city of Shanghai where the Chinese remain uh, living in, in residence and the trading and commerce had focused on at one time. So here, going basically uh, from the, Yang, the Suzhou River, which goes to Suzhou further up in the Yangtze Delta, it links up to Shanghai Harbor and links up to other areas. If those of you who were in Shanghai went to the fair three years ago, you'll note that this area was uh, covered by a, 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 a place of gardens and um, agricultural wear. We want to watch this particular area of gardens grow precipitously into the arsenal of East Asia uh, in this point. But how it got there is a longer story. So I want you to see that we have the foreign city under the Bund, but we also have the, the Chinese city under the Chinese state. The Bund is independent and has its own laws and brings in its own people, hires its own uh, employees. Uh, the Chinese uh, city itself, older and going back to better days in the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, is holding the fort in this particular area, which is bigger, who's going to win, is unclear in the 1840s. But nonetheless, the foreign consortium is using uh, access to the lower Yangtze River to get access to the upper Yangtze River, going into uh, Sichuan province. So the Yangtze is the avenue towards success, power, and money. The foreign uh, ground, ground the, the foreign concession, concession here from the British is, and French and, and, China, and Americans, is access to this very important waterway connecting north, north, and, north and south and east and west. So this is where the, the central area for trade and commerce is, is emerging. And what we normally get, Shanghai in 1851, we get the foreign world of uh, the West, particularly the English, the Americans, and the French quarters, and we get nothing from, for, for the uh, uh, Chinese city that was there. Here we can see the, uh, uh, they change the, the rules a little bit and move the north to the, to, to the north and uh, build a different view of it. But here, central uh, Nanjing Road is here, and the district is here, the North Great Chinese City is here, uh, and it's the northern city uh, that gains most of the attention from the point of view of Europe, but the population size of Shanghai is much greater and in many ways still very important throughout this period. So it's a tale of two cities. It's a tale of the city of Shanghai under uh, Manchu and Chinese control for centuries in the past, and the new city that's emerging from the Europeans, particularly the British and the French, and some of the Americans, co co coming up with a larger framework for this area. So I want you to get a sense of China, uh, uh, Shanghai in particular, is being cut up. It's being cut up in such a way that people forget to talk about it even as a place that needs to be cut up. The Europeans pretend it doesn't exist the waterways in the uh, Chinese uh, part of the ports, and the new ports bringing in the new steamers and others from uh, uh, Europe are quite uh, separate in this, in this framework. So we want to sort of look at uh, the maps of Shanghai as revealing the transition from a Chinese Manchu city and uh, trading network into a, a Manchu uh, province, that uh, Manchu provenance that covers the Chinese city still, but allows a huge number of Europeans and their Chinese workers to operate in the northern part on the routes to Suzhou and into central, central China. So this is an important uh, place of uh, interest for all of us, and we need to sort of understand how this outline plan of the foreign settlements evolved, and uh, that this is the beginning point of the centrality of Shanghai in Chinese trade. Uh, and commerce, and we need to take that seriously and understand stand it, but also indicate that the Wampo River and the other rivers in this area are equally part of the rise of this city. It's also rising in the, in the, in the framework of the new treaty ports that have been opened up, uh, just as in Japan, they're opened up here in uh, China for uh, bringing trade and commerce directly to India, from India, Southeast Asia, directly into the British uh, concessions in the city of, uh, of, of uh, Shanghai.
Here we have a map that sort of begins to give you a sense of the city emerging. Uh, this is the western part, which is gaining in size and shape, and the elite of uh, the old city of uh, uh, Shanghai is slowly but surely staying the same. It's what we would call stagnant. Population is relatively the same, uh, although it has the same area as before. It's the Europeans that, uh, uh, in the upper uh, areas of Shanghai along the river, that we see the growth in economic trade and commerce on a mass scale and on a scale that has never had not been uh, achieved up to that point. So this, the Chinese city is there, but it's still the old Chinese city. Um, this will become Chinatown. Uh, in the 21st century, when tourists come to China, they want to see quaint Shanghai. The, uh, the Bund is not very much of interest, so they wind, wind up seeing Chinatown. And Chinatown was a prominent uh, city under the Manchus, under the Ming Dynasty, going back to the Song Dynasty, and as early as the Tang and, Tang and Song Dynasty was one of the leading cities of the empire. And here we have eight, eight or nine cities that people are brought into. The, bolt, the, 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 the walls were necessary. Uh, to protect the inner families and groups and officials and traders and uh, those uh, involved with the dynasty. And it was not repeated by the, uh, out, uh, by the, uh, they were not repeated by the uh, uh, Europeans uh, here. The European areas were usually wide open. There were no, no uh, walls to keep people out. The walls were maintained in the Chinese part of the city, which I think we need to sort of keep into track. It was a walled city, both conceptually and physically, uh, in that regard. So this is your map. Uh, this is more or less half of what is left. Uh, uh, this is uh, the Chinatown that today is being built up with uh, McDonald's and various other kinds of commodities coming from the West uh, in, this, in this time. The opium was coming in uh, this, through these, these ways in earlier times. And we see the new northern gate, gate that's being opened up in this in this period, the small eastern gate. These gates were, uh, became cultural icons, but useless in terms of law and order or trade and commerce. They were just simply there for occupation and for people passing back and forth into the uh, European quarters, the French quarter, the American quarter, and the British quarter were certainly the most popular of the trading networks. So you have, in many ways, it's hard to say two parallel cities. They're next to each other. They have a good deal to do with each other, and yet they're, coming, they're reacting to two different governmental regimes. One, an empire of uh, Manchu emperors uh, who go back for 250 years and are operating in that community and uh, trying to control uh, the wealth and power of this very rich dynasty that had been able to hold off the British and the French and the uh, others coming in until the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, many of you have probably not heard of the Taiping Rebellion, it's not the typewriter rebellion that we hear about so from some people. The Taiping Rebellion was a rebellion of a huge mass of uh, uh, peoples in South, Southeast China that wanted the Manchus out, and they wanted to build a new society, return their society to the previous form, and they wanted to take on new ideals, Christianity by the, by, done by, by the Manchus, done by the, the uh, 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 Taipings. The Taipings claimed to have leaders who had direct contact access to Jesus, direct contact to God, and therefore they were the real Christians. The Christians from England, France, and Germany elsewhere were regarded as frauds or were regarded as brothers. And so the new uh, icon of brotherhood emerged with one of the Taiping rebels being included in the uh, uh, rebell rebellions, the, the, uh, the, 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 the world of the uh, uh, Europeans in this context. This tore the city uh, apart in some ways, but it was spared destruction in 1860, uh, roughly 1857 maybe, to eight, 1867 or so. Uh, there was a huge civil war in these areas, and up to 40 million people perished. Up to, it's unclear, 20 million is bad enough, 30 or 40 is even quite worse in this context. And so in this framework, we want to see that these uh, areas are being brought into a much larger uh, conflict zone. And uh, in many ways, Shanghai is not the, the biggest city in the area, but it becomes the biggest city because the other cities are wiped out. If you can imagine a civil war fought in the United States, in, in, in the, fought like this in, uh, in, in uh, the United States, you would have had Washington fall twice. You would have had uh, the uh, Philadelphia-Boston uh, triangles uh, and the like. They would fall three times. 
and that those urban centers and political centers would be destroyed by the civil war of the 1850s. Well, that's bad enough, but in the Shanghai case, Shanghai was spared the, the boundary. It was uh, ultimately protected by both Manchus, but more particularly Europeans who wanted trade and commerce and would fight for the Manchus and the Manchu dynasty to maintain it. So cleverly uh, or not, the Manchus had made, been able to bring the British across to their side. And the, the money was coming from the arrangements of the Qing dynasty. The Taipings were gathering up the horses and peasants in the cities and uh, shipping ports internal to the dynasty. And there the war was fought. And it was fought seriously. Guns and weapons increased precisely in technology to defeat these Taipings in, in these uh, forts and factories that were emerging in these areas. So what happened was everything around the cities, both the uh, European and the uh, Manchu cities that we call Shanghai, were protected by foreign groups from the rest of the, the Yangtze Delta and other areas. So they fit into this system in such a way that they were agreeing to work with the British and others in this framework, and they would defend the dynasty against these crazy uh, peasant rebellion rebels who claimed to be related to Jesus Christ, and one of whom claimed to be the brother of Jesus Christ. I don't laugh at that when I hear it. Uh, when you take into account the issues of the forging of Christianity in the very beginning, Joseph and others, it's very hard to figure out what was going on. Here, similarly, the, the, mystif the mystification of the Christian church through incorporation into a typing ideology is something no one expected. And the uh, Europeans were astonished that someone in, in another cultural realm could claim that they had someone who was the brother of Jesus Christ. I mean, most of you in this room would think that's laughable. Uh, but would you laugh about how they got to be Abraham and Isaac and all the others, the way they uh, operated in a, a historical framework we don't know very much about? I'm leaving it open to their, their beliefs and their possibilities, rather than dictating their, their idiocies and their wrong-headed ideologies. It's, from my point of view, looking at internally what up to 40, 50 million, perhaps as high as 100 million Chinese are rebelling against this emerging uh, uh, Manchu uh, European uh, monolith of trade, commerce, and growth. And most of the Europeans wind up on the side of the Manchu state uh, into the 70s, 80s, and 90s, up to 1900. Unexpected but un unusual. We still remain uh, uh, unclear how it worked. it worked out that the agreements in the customs houses brought the English and the French and the Americans and others together with the Manchu state to forge a union uh, under the Manchu state and uh, grow the dynasty in a way that the British and the French and the China Americans also prospered. So lurking behind this is a, a group of clever bankers, clever uh, physicians, clever doctors, clever traders, uh, clever missionary, military people, and missionaries above all, coming in to save China, to uh, protect, protect China, and to build the world of Shanghai in uh, its uh, mirror of the European societies and changes going on. It was a huge experiment from the 1850s. It still goes on in some ways uh, to this very day in terms of the control of mass uh, education, mass uh, 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 issues of health and uh, the like. And so in this context, we begin to see that the uh, uh, future of China is up for grabs in many ways. Uh, what the, those, from their point of view, it's unclear how it's going to evolve. From our point of view, we know that the Taipings are, are defeated in 18, 1867 and, uh, and, and removed and eliminated very, very uh, ferociously by the four troops. Chinese Gordon made his, uh, his reputation here. Later, he wound up in Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, fighting in the civil wars there. But he was known as Chinese Gordon because he married a Chinese woman and then uh, served for, again, in the, the force that the merchants paid for to save, protect Shanghai from the uh, uh, Taiping Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion was a huge, massive uh, subsidy for 300 to 350 million Chinese. It was a huge population area. And China had now reached areas of 500 million people in the whole uh, land that had never been that big before. The scale was increasing beyond belief. Uh, certainly in India, we know that population growth was going beyond belief as well. And so in this context, China and India fall into this population production trap. They produce a lot, but they produce less per capita. 
In other words, they produce ten times as much money uh, in products as they do as they do other things. But in the end, their production doesn't keep up with population. Population becomes immiserated, becomes less and less less wealthy, less and less able to forge through these uh, costs and uh, the range the range of them. So in many ways, we begin to see the the Indian model then uh, t uh, carried over to the. Uh, Ch Chinese model, where their production is always high. They're producing more of everything, rice, uh, various kinds of goods, silks and the like, but they're producing so many in a context of even more population. How do you keep up with it? Uh, the Americans are beginning to think about it in terms of 300 million, 400 million Americans, and can the Iowa farmers and the Nebraska farmers pay up for the needs of that level of the society. Perhaps, perhaps not, but it turned out that the key figure for the Chinese empire was 350 million, at which point they ran out of uh, uh, the ability to control these forces and ultimately could, could not control the population uh, uh, bomb that was, that was say, breaking off. That's in some ways why in the 20th century, 21st century, the communists were pressing this so greatly on the society, because they recognized one of the fundamental problems was that the uh, system was set up to have certainly an upper class of rich people, but it was also set up in such a way that more and more people had less and less uh, to, to, to eat, to, to use for uh, their lives. So I simply want to show you that Shanghai is caught up into that framework, and the glamour of Shanghai uh, is tied into this overlap between production is going higher and higher, and the richer can afford it at all costs, and the poor and poor cannot afford it, and they are immiserated. They are in many ways left at the bottom of this framework. So this uh, population boom uh, it has its uh, other side. And I would say we always underestimate the productivity, but we never we always underestimate the population growth. We never underestimate the production of uh, goods and commodities, which was singularly uh, very high. But divided by 500 million uh, people, that made for very low standards of living, in fact, in, in, that, in that context. Uh, the United States is in the midst of facing that trap. I doubt here you'll have much of a problem with population uh, and, econ and economy uh, for uh, perhaps a few more decades. But then eventually, India and China become precursors of this uh, later realized economic rule. Is the, the more population outgrow outgrows your figures, the more that people get less and less rather than more and more. That population will de determine the, what's going on here. So lurking underneath these population exchanges and lurking underneath these kinds of interactions, the uh, population is changing dramatically. And even with a dip of 45 million by the Taiping Rebellion, it very quickly by 1900 it's back up to about 500 million. So it's a huge problem for the Chinese to deal with, and hence why the communists prioritized it very clearly in the beginning when they dealt with it. This is the old docks that uh, remain in, remained in China, uh, in Shanghai for quite a while. Uh, this was the other side of the city and the area that the uh, Chinese used. Their junks are predominant here. The ferry, the f boats that the Europeans carried are on the other side we just saw. And here we have parallel cities on the edges of these conflicting forces. And in many ways, uh, the sh Shanghai gained its autonomy by balancing these needs and conceptions. And, uh, Manchu emperors and Chinese mandarins uh, uh, helped create space in this area for the growth of both the Chinese city and the uh, 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 new, new city of Shanghai emerging. Here in the midst of this, we begin to see science emerging in the trading networks here. And it's a clumsy in, in exchange. Uh, we haven't followed through on it very carefully enough to realize what's going on. But slowly but surely, the Chinese are beginning to react to science react to engineering, and not just to talk about it and to laugh at it and to appeal to their own ancient values, but to be able to master these materials to be rulers of their own fate in the military Asina. These are journals that are being produced by the, the uh, missionaries from, uh, from Europe in particular, uh, and they are translated into Chinese to deal with the issues that they're being uh, dealt, that they're dealing with. You can see that the overland routes between England, India, and China sort of give you the, the scope of this, where India and China are sort of faced with dealing with this. The form of the earth, first principles of the steam, machine, steam engine. This is already being raised in 1853 to, to build the, the, the steam engine. 
uh, that is being run. And you can begin to see there's a huge interest in this kind of thing. The admiral of the vice, the, the arrival of the vice admiral, Sir Fleetwood Pelou and Spelmavia and other groups are uh, uh, written out. And so this is all being recorded. Here we have the, uh, the largest journal dealing with science in this period of time, the Liu Sung Han, which uh, tried to focus on scientific issues and uh, trade and commerce in this period of time. You can see that uh, notice of new books is uh, logarithms uh, and uh, uh, tri trigonometry and uh, logarithmic tables to be raised in this framework. In other words, the new mathematics, the new engineer's textbook of uh, uh, technological writing and the new ways to solve equations was being taught and learned in this framework. Here you have birth of an English princess, giving you the interaction with England. But we're learning very quickly that French preparations for war in Algeria are being covered in these accounts, along with Portuguese and Sicilian stories, Fem Finland and uh, the other. China is being drawn into the world global system and learning, being, and learning about it as well in this context. The old city in 1884 begins to spurt forward. It uh, never achieves the uh, growth and scale of the uh, first the city of the Western, uh, uh, of the Western colonialists. But this area goes through a number of urban renewals, shall we say, and repeats itself. It never quite breaks out of the population trap. But over time, it begins to sort of recover uh, enough of a, a swell that the families that uh, do have some goods and means can live on for a short period of time. But the amount of begging uh, in the streets is legendary. The amount of poverty in the streets is legendary as we re deal with these uh, frameworks from the point of view of uh, scales uh, and maps of these uh, uh, events that they, don't, that they don't tell us exactly what was happening. We have a pretty good idea. Here's Nanjing Road about 1900. You can see the two-story buildings are everywhere. And certainly this is the kind of Chinatown uh, building that's being constructed in Southeast Asia. If you went to Bangkok or you went to uh, Malaysia or those areas, you found housing from the, for the Chinese merchants and the like brought up into this area, and usually no more than two stories. The two-story streets uh, have been cap captured that way, uh, and certainly other cities in, uh, uh, in, in this area have captured that as well. And here we see uh, the San Law being dragged and the, the nature of the society that's there, the merchant elites that are there. And here we have some of the uh, 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 streets that are, again, four-story, two-story uh, uh, mansions. These are not your 100-story uh, Singapore uh, buildings that you might see elsewhere. These are very preliminary, easy uh, to build uh, wood, wood plentiful areas. Remarkably, within this framework of money, traversing the entire society for different kinds of things. Money, of course, buys women, uh, whether we like it or not. And in this situation, we begin to see women's fashions in China changing dramatically into not necessarily the, 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 the game that we associate with uh, a business, but with women uh, reacting by saying that we want to drop the old regime of dress and costume and want to engage in a new one. Some of this is by women themselves. Some of this is by men uh, who produce this for women, who are the major uh, purveyors of this. But nonetheless, we can begin to see that Shanghai, in its free Western zone, is open to these tactics, open to these uh, issues, and that buying opium and having opium uh, on your agenda is not any much that much different from having women on your agenda as well. And this begins to be a significant problem uh, for uh, China and particularly. Uh, the Yangtze Delta in this period of time. It looks fairly harmless. Uh, traditional instruments, the Bund is lit up during holidays, and women are dancing, riding bicycles, and the like. It's peaceful, but looking beneath it, of course, as we know in our own society, and our own issues, the uses of women are certainly turned into economic features of the framework that, that, that they're dealing with. Here are the good guys or the bad guys, depending on who you want to deal with here. These are the Green Gang triads, who had to come from Fujian province, south southern China. And uh, they are the ones who sort of mop up and clean up and take, take, take track, keep track of the societies in Shanghai and elsewhere that need this. The state's reach is very into the provinces, but not down to the village levels or city levels. So it's these green triads that uh, you can see their somber look. Uh, these are older men that when they were younger, this is what they looked like. They looked like drug takers. 
Uh, somebody had to be taking the drugs. Somebody had to be drinking uh, the various issues that were coming forth. So the opium den became a very prominent uh, uh, symbol. And in the midst of this, the, uh, the, the concluding point I want to make is the Jiangnan arsenal in Shanghai emerges as the largest fort, the largest military establishment in the area in the uh, 1860s, 70s, and 1880s, and 90s. It's a manufacturing uh, uh, center. It uh, is a, a major uh, arsenal. Uh, it has a budget from the state of 250,000 silver dollars, 348 silver dollars in value, and that these are being built in Shanghai and other states as well for the state to put, pull together and gain control of its uh, areas. So we begin to see in this reflection of money and where it is going, one of the places it's going from the point of view of the state is military power. And they've learned their lesson in many ways about the dangers of not being ready to fight for your own turf and your own issues. It was many Shanghai's was saved by the British and the Europeans. Now, this Shanghai has made it possible to open the first arsenals in, in so-called China, Greater China, uh, in Shanghai, and in other areas as well. So China becomes, begins to be a huge naval port, but particularly Shanghai does. And, uh, uh, you can see the scale of this. This is uh, remarkably the, a huge scale that has been worked out in agreements with the foreigners who open the banks that fund these events. The bankers give you 30 years, and they allow the dynasty to invest its for, uh, costs and to build these large-scale arsenals. And where are the arsenals located? They're located in the orchards. This is in an orchard, a quaint orchard outside the center of the city for 200 years in the Ming Dynasty. It was now sucked into the empire of uh, the Shanghai, uh, the European Shanghai, and the Chinese Shanghai. And it was drawn into this framework. And uh, many European missionaries and others helped build this uh, uh, naval power, helped build this military power, and uh, ultimately also helped uh, arrange the things that kept it strong. Uh, this is a joint effort between the Europeans and the uh, Chinese Qing dynasty to maintain the, great, the last great dynasty, the Manchu dynasty. Uh, in this. And here we have the beginnings of the growth of that arsenal here. And uh, we know that uh, Wiley worked there, McGowan worked there, Crayer worked there. I'm not so sure about uh, our, our, our fellow here. George M M Morrison was a little bit later. He would have been 1890s, 1900s, but had to live within this framework of Shanghai as well. He was involved in discussing issues with uh, the, uh, uh, the Chinese forces and different groups. Uh, ben and his staff have done a good job of bringing that forward to, to allow us to understand that, that kind of thing. But these were missionaries, shall we say, gone wrong, that they were working building guns and weapons in mathematics and astronomy for the weaponry that was needed at that time. Reading the elements of geology was not necessarily something that they did for fun. This was to find out you know, what the earth and soil uh, values were and how to build cities and build around them as well. And this became a very important rain area of some people like Li Shanlan translating Newton's Principia and creating the equations that were necessary for an engineer's, engineer's life. These are uh, factories brought together, uh, uh, factories for building uh, ironclad weapons, ships, and uh, uh, different kinds of steel ships and weaponry all around. And we can begin to see that Shanghai has a big arsenal on its uh, back door. And the arsenal makes a big difference in the future wars that China will fight through this area. These are the uh, arsenal's uh, types of factories and what was grown, growing through it. I won't give you the, 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 the details, but this is the entrance area to the, the, the Shanghai uh, uh, arsenal. And this is one of the workers there, Xu Xiu, worked with the, worked with the ship missionaries to translate these materials, but ultimately provided them for usage in the arsenals where uh, warfare was paid for through these taxes and through these special customs funds that were made available. Here's John Fryer uh, from England, uh, who uh, seems to enjoy this a great deal. He was uh, appointed a high-level Qing official uh, in his last years of 1894-95, and he himself later came to Berkeley to set up the Berkeley East Asian Studies, uh, Asian Studies community based on the funds and materials. He had been somewhat of a failure in England before he came to China, and in China he found his place. 
And he became uh, a key translator of military material, mathematical material, scientific material, and he wore the traditional costume to show that he was worthy of such events. I want to sort of impress upon you that people like John Fryer and others bought into this system and played within it and dealt with it because it gave them great profit, great wealth, and ultimately access to uh, a good many uh, amenities in uh, sexual, sexual uh, benefits as well. So Fryer is going to come to Berkeley before Berkeley is Berkeley. It's a Berkeley college at that point and set up uh, the beginnings of the Asian Studies program at uh, uh, UCLA, at U U University of California, Berkeley, before anywhere else. So I want you to take a look at this and see this on top of all these other levels that I've been talking about. Here we have Xu Jiayin, Hua Hengfeng, and Xu Xiao. These are the masterminders of the translators. They need all the calculus text, they need all the geometry text translated into these languages, both English and ultimately machine languages that are used here. And so their translation office is a major center within the, uh, uh, the arsenal. And here we can see that poor Fryer is not even in the picture. Was he taking the picture or was he uh, away or something? The Chinese are taking the picture themselves and ignoring perhaps his Fryer's contribution. Here we have journals. This is the Peking Magazine journal that begins to carry regularly scientific goods and information, sort of science, scientific information journals. Here we have uh, the, uh, Princeton, the Peking Magazine uh, talking about uh, dealing with uh, uh, the Western countries and uh, the role of geography, the problems of math mathematics, uh, and uh, the like, and going on from there. Here we have the Guzhou Huibian Scientific and Industrial Magazine, monthly journal. This is produced in Shanghai in this period of time for an interested community in science and technology that is slowly but surely growing and enlarging. As the Chinese state begins to increasingly fail, the new sector is not taking office but getting into economic uh, ex exchanges that bear, bear, bear forth military power and also bear worth the new science directions that are absolutely necessary. So this is brimming at the top. This is not controlling the coffee at the bottom, but it's brimming at the top, and these are going on in such a way that we can begin to see these events occurring in China in 1890s, 1900s, building over the 20th century and continuing today. Uh, this is a continuous framework that the Chinese have been choosing for whether good or bad reasons for long, for many, many decades now. These are the, the various textbooks that produce translations of Western textbooks on mathematics, most of them in English, most of them from Manchester or from uh, 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 London. Here you can begin to see how the, the, the new gardens are going to be, the new uh, agricultural uh, lands are going to be kept intact uh, through these pumps. Uh, and uh, running water up hills and controlling the water with dams. They're learning the, the new niceties of ruining your topography by building them up behind dams and the like. But nonetheless, this scientific and industrial magazine is a big hit, not for, among millions, but certainly several thousand are buying out the actu actual monthly uh, subscriptions at that period of time. And here we see again similar aspects of the mechanization of Chinese industry uh, and control along the the Yangtze Delta. These are the reading books. We know the textbooks, and most of these are uh, translations of Chinese, of uh, British textbooks, as I said, in, uh, in, in, uh, in England, and being sent as translations by Fryer and the other groups that are involved. And the venues for buying them and selling them were clear to everyone, and the Chinese prize essay was clear to everyone. These are questions they began to ask in their examinations. And there were examinations on uh, different questions. Newton, for example, is queried in these questions. And uh, in one of the queries here, we have the, the framework of, uh, of Darwin. Darwin is here a, a big hitter uh, for the future of the strong and the weakness of the weak. Uh, and uh, there begins to be kind of uh, neo, neo interest in the uh, influence of Darwin and Darwin's theories in the growth and fall of great societies. So I'm giving you a, mis a, a mismatch of all these materials mixing up together that we need to make more and more sense out of as we do research. But before we do that research, we have to recreate that mess and see how that mess operated and how it is that these go along with Newton, go along with women as prostitutes, go along with monetary customs agents. All of these different aspects are rolling through these societies, as you know through your society here as well. And here we begin to see the efforts to use science 
and scientific knowledge to bring China out of its uh, uh, abyss and to compete with the other states. So within this, there's interesting questions about Newton and questions about uh, uh, Darwin and answers by the candidates. It turns out the candidate that answers this question in the 1860s was given a scholarship from the Taiping, the Beijing government to go to Europe and tour uh, Europe and get the latest textbooks and learn about these issues. So science and technology is high on the agenda, and we can see that this is your parallel to the peddlers on Shandong Road, that this is at multi-levels, and multi-levels are going on here. The military is very highly placed. The naval power is very highly placed, and it's been that way for many, many uh, uh, decades since the uh, late 19th century. Here you can begin to see the city of Shanghai emerging and outpacing its buildings, outpacing uh, its uh, Chinese section and European section, and the European section fails, falls apart, and most of the missionaries and others are forced out by the 1950s. 1933, the city is already a powerhouse, a great city uh, that uh, ultimately lives through the travails of the 30s, 40s, and 50s with uh, remarkable abilities. These are the boons in the 1930s. You can see the constructions that are going on. I've simply tried to give you a kind of context for understanding the question of what happened to China, why did it fail, and did it fail in this situation? And so I've given you a, a, set, a set of a list of things here we could argue for. But I would say in many ways, China's failure, Japan's success, European success, are not necessarily universal and eternal, that these change over time and that the Chinese are, and Japanese are searching for ways to overcome the European and uh, European interests and strengths in their ideals and bring together them under the framework of new military power and new naval power in this period of time. The scale of money uh, in this, uh, for example, in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, it cost about 7.45 million kegs of, uh, uh, of silver 3.8 billion, if you figure it, figure it out. That's about 6.4 times the Japanese government's annual revenue that they, they were spending on warfare and to, uh, their navies at that period of time. Uh, the Chinese used to, we, we, we were sending a good deal of their money to Japan because they lost the wars that were fought at that time. Fri Friar, for example, by 1895 was fed up with China, argued that China was over, its language would fail, and the Chinese would be simply, simply serving, serving the new Western powers. Uh, the general decay of the Chinese language and literature, uselessness. And we have uh, one of Chinese, China's most famous si si uh, philosophers, Feng Yulan, writing in the 1920s, Why China Has No Science, an interpretation of the history and consequences of Chinese philosophy. So you can begin to see the heavy-handedness this is getting into academic circles. And there are scientific reasons for Chinese to have failed in their scientific endeavors. I would suggest there are other good historical reasons to explain that without well, having to go through this menagerie. The story I'm telling is not a very positive one. Uh, it's in many ways even standard. We need to know a lot more about how this operated, uh, how the different groups fit in with each other. Uh, and uh, in the end, we can begin to see why someone like Feng Yulan had no idea that there had been science in China at different levels for several centuries, uh, but changed in dramatically in the 18th and 19th century. Restoring respect to the Chinese contributions to their own sciences is something that we can begin with. Uh, it's something that uh, you can begin with in terms of their, their loyalties to their own communities, their own societies, and their own values, but at the same time being caught with not wanting to be caught with their panty, panties down trying to fight the European superior forces. That this was a, a military agenda as well. And what kept China back is that she has no science. And I don't think Feng Yilan quite understood what he was saying. But what, he say, what he was saying was quite significant. In this world that we live in, you can't go anywhere without military power. And you can't defend yourself without military power. And this is necessary, and we need uh, to, to work with it. So this debate about science in China is more than just an intellectual debate. It's a fully uh, political, uh, economic, cultural, and a dynamic uh, problem that all, almost all societies, societies have to deal with, who's not going to have science now that would to preserve their cultures and values? Who's not going to have economic and military uh, power through the new equations that they get through Newton uh, and others uh, in, this, in this world? So it's the amalgamation of these issues that tells you why Shanghai was the center for algebra, was the center for uh, the new sciences, the new uh, engineers. At the same time, all this other stuff is happening in the mix and how we put it all together. 
I leave for the next generation. I'll try myself to sort of con contribute to this kind of uh, contribution. But it demands rethinking the endings and going back to the beginnings and asking yourself, how did Shanghai get to be the way it was in the very beginning? What happened? What happened to, to Tokyo uh, in, the many, in its frameworks of dealing with the West in the Second World War? Tokyo was utterly destroyed, almost to the last man, woman, and building. Uh, in this context. So I'm not painting a positive picture. I'm painting, a, hopefully, a creative picture of a very difficult time for the Chinese and the, the other groups in East Asia, but focusing on Shanghai as one example. Uh, Shanghai has the high life. It certainly does, but the high life itself uh, shows the underside of the high life in uh, quite clear form at that time. With all those uh, nooks and crannies that I've left out, I welcome any questions that you might, might have concerning these introductory endings that we can begin to think about. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, I think it's clear that in this period, um, uh, Shanghai was a very various, diverse, and somewhat confused place. That's not to say that um, uh, your presentation wasn't immensely clear, but the topic that you chose for yourself, I think, was one that uh, resists simplification. And I think it's a, a mark of um, the true historian that the, uh, the simple story is rejected. Um, if a place was a mess, find out what kind of a mess that place was and try to think through uh, the different layers and the different uh, aspects of the society in that place. Um, certainly, though, I think that for most of us here, I mean, many of us here have been to Shanghai. Some of us know Shanghai quite well. Now, um, a presentation like this with such, actually such extraordinary images that you, you showed us is both revealing of the, of the past of the place that many of us know, some of us come from, um, but also uh, a kind of sense of how that place came to be. And now walking around the streets, even though you know, Nanjing Road does, doesn't look anything like that anymore, and you see a map where Pudong is empty, whereas now Pudong is an you know, extraordinary place. Um, nonetheless, you can see this kind of Shanghai that you've presented to us somehow in the Shanghai that, that we visit now the extraordinary place that it is.